I'm not sure why I wanted to make classical vaporwave, but in this video I hope I'll convince you that I did. If you're not sure what vaporwave is, well, the short answer is it's a form of electronic music and internet culture that arose in the 2010s that distorts old tunes and slows them down. Here, let me show you. Now at first glance, making the classical version of this doesn't seem to make much sense. Aren't classical compositions supposed to be the height of sophistication, originality, intelligence and individuality? So why would a classical composer like me want to imitate something that seems, on the surface, so basic and uninspired? Vaporwave does have a whole visual culture revolving around retro visuals from the 1980s and it's sometimes described as being a critique of consumer culture. But in purely musical terms, its main feature is that it takes an old track and you slow it down and distort it a little. somehow, despite that seeming simplicity, vaporwave music often ends up feeling like much more than the sum of its parts. Vaporwave tracks are so strange because they're equal parts funny, they're ridiculous because they're just a slowed down track at the end of the day, they're haunting, they're nostalgic, they make you long for a time in the 80s when these tracks were made even if you weren't born then. And then they also sometimes dive into something much darker and have more of a sinister undertone. So this simple process of slowing stuff down and maybe distorting or blurring it a little ends up having a multitude of different emotions and different types of music that can come out of it. And I had the feeling there was more to explore here. Could classical music have something to say in a vaporwave-like style? And I think one of the best examples of what classical vaporwave might be is by a composer called Ryan Ayres, who takes that same Diana Ross track that we heard earlier, and they slow it down even further. So you can still hear those same chords, but now they're on a symphony orchestra, and I think it sounds absolutely amazing. I just love the power that that has. It has all of those vaporwave qualities. It's intense, it's mysterious, it's haunting, it's nostalgic, it's kind of funny. Don't you think that's quite amazing to have all of that bundled up in one idea? One thing that vaporwave artists seem to think about a lot is nostalgia for a kind of lost past. And it seems to be something that's come particularly since the turn of the millennium, maybe since 9-11, maybe since the rise of the internet or possibly social media. There's this sense that there was a world in that previous time in the 20th century that is now kind of lost to us and we can't access it anymore. A more innocent period where there were a lot less things to worry about. Now I'm going to ask you for an indulgence on our quest to find a classical version of vaporwave. So if traditional vaporwave is usually obsessed with the 1980s, could we allow classical music to look a little further back? I just came back from the premiere of a new concerto for violin and string orchestra that I wrote called Luli Loops, which was premiered by Daniel Hope and the Zurich Chamber Orchestra. And when I was writing it, as you can probably guess by the title, I became a little obsessed with Jean-Baptiste Luli, a composer who worked in the court of Louis XIV in Versailles during the latter half of the 17th century. As well as composing, Lully was in charge of one of the very first string orchestras, Les 24 Violons du Roi. If you talk about music from the 1980s feeling distant, well, what about the 1680s? Here I am in 2023 writing for an orchestra of stringed instruments, not that different from the orchestra Lully wrote for. Only in his day, no one had really ever heard an orchestra before. What's that sound? The sound of the orchestral strings that we're so familiar with today was unknown to them. For most people, any kind of live music performance would have felt like something incredibly special. Whereas today we're so blasé about having a composer like Luli's entire output at our fingertips. We can load it into Spotify, we can grab it and download it into Audacity, chop it up a bit, loop it and distort it, do what we like to it. 
The technology is amazing, but it also separates us from previous eras of music making. There's definitely something that we've lost in the process. And as it happens, chopping up a clip of Luli is exactly what I did when I needed some background music for the section on Luli's orchestra in a recent video I made about the history of the orchestra. It was just a passing moment in a larger piece, but this was the clip I used. And I found myself haunted by this passage. It was, I think, the first signs of the vaporwave spirit growing within me. And I decided to base an entire first movement of my new piece around just this fragment. It seemed quite a fitting tribute to one of the first composers for string orchestra. So there I'm quoting Luli's original but surrounding it in a sort of haze of harmonics. I wasn't yet thinking about slowing it down or making something with an uncanny, unsettling feeling. So don't worry, I'm not quite calling this classical vaporwave just yet. But I was thinking about drawing out this nostalgic element, perhaps giving a sense of Lully peeking through the haze of history. You can hear in these clips how I'm blurring, distorting and overlaying the original idea. And a bit like in Vaporwave, this seems to heighten the nostalgic effect. In the second movement I tried a slightly different tack. I took another track by Luli. But this time I played with the rhythm. Played with it a bit more. And then the movement culminates quite ferociously. It's quite a long way from the dreamy aesthetic of Vaporwave, but it does have this curious relationship between the present and the past that you find in Vaporwave. You can still sense the past, sense the shards of Lully and his music, but it's now thrown into this kind of washing machine of modernity. Okay, so I know neither of these movements will convince you that I actually did write classical Vaporwave, but before I show you the third and most Vaporwave-y movement, let me show you two other composers who I also think have a decent claim to call themselves composers of classical vaporwave. The first is Cassandra Miller. She wrote a piece called Bel Canto, and in this she takes phrases by the opera singer Maria Callas, who died in the 1970s. distorts them and blurs them. So you get this kind of weird echoey memory of the sound of Maria Callas. That strikes me as extremely similar to the kinds of things that happen in Vaporwave. And another one is Robin Haig, who you may remember from the Five Composers Heavy Metal Band video. And he actually wrote his entire doctoral dissertation about classical Vaporwave. It was called Composing Millennial Nostalgia, Microtonal Techniques as Tools to Express a 21st Century Malady in Tonal Music. Good PhD title. Robin's not so interested in the floating trance-like atmospheres you get in Vaporwave. He's more interested in making this nostalgic effect by distorting familiar ideas. And in his case, he tends to think of it as distorting tonal harmony. And he gave me this example where you first of all hear the idea presented fairly cleanly. And then this is the distorted version.
So let's come back to Luli Loops now. And for my third movement, I found this tune, which I originally thought was by Luli. I think I found it on an album of Luli, but it, it turned out to be by his father-in-law, Michel Lambert. But that's okay. <laughs> This time I did slow it down. I looped around small segments of it and gradually allowed the loop to move through the original tune. So you only get a tiny bit of it at a time. It moves very slowly. I think it's three to four minutes to get through maybe 40 seconds of the original, something like that. So like Vaporwave, it slows down and stretches the original. But then also like Vaporwave, it blurs and distorts it. The soloist plays the main line, but then each of the five first violinists behind him play the same line, but staggered as an entry like a cannon. I also made them muted, so it's like a sort of echo effect behind him, it's blurring and echoing the main line. There are further blurrings of the accompanying harmony with glissandi and harmonic overlaps. And to top it all off, I added a kind of walking bass, for no other reason than I just felt it made it better. At the end of the movement, I had the bright idea of taking it further and going full Christopher Nolan, as in Tenet, and reversing the whole thing. Don't try to understand it. Feel it. So not just playing the notes backwards like in a Bach retrograde, but actually trying to recreate the sound of an audio tape when you flip it into reverse and you play the whole track backwards. So lots of meow kind of effects. So that's definitely the darkest moment in the piece where you get this almost terrifying sensation because we've distorted the original almost beyond recognition now. It goes into much darker territory. So, I don't know, you tell me. I've borrowed an old tune, I've slowed it down, I've distorted it, and the results sound a mixture of uncanny, haunting, nostalgic, and terrifying. I mean, okay, I didn't add any images of, I don't know, nostalgic technology from Looney's time, like a globe or a telescope or something. But apart from that, I feel pretty justified in labeling this a piece of classical vaporwave. Now, the more perceptive among you will realise that there's still several minutes left on the video, and that's not because we've got a massive advert, although I would be very happy if you helped the algorithm by liking, subscribing, and maybe dropping a comment. And of course, I'd be very grateful if you'd consider supporting the channel by joining my patrons over on Patreon. But for the rest of the video, I want to go slightly off topic. I don't know why I got so obsessed with labels on this piece, but there's another label that I came across recently that I think also applies to both my piece and possibly to Vaporwave itself, and that is the term metamodernism. I think I first came across this term in a fantastic video essay by Thomas Flight a few months ago, which is called Why Do Movies Feel So Different Now? So if you want to explore all of this in movie terms, please check that out because he's way more eloquent than I ever could be. So we've all heard the terms modernism and postmodernism. They always mean slightly different things in different art forms. But in the case of modernism, there's usually a sense of a drive towards progress and innovation. 
It embraces what's called the grand narratives or the idea that there's a universal standard pushing the boundaries of the art to new horizons, often with the belief in a single linear path. Musical modernism usually avoids direct quotations from earlier styles and aims to be a self-enclosed, self-referencing entity. There's also an undertone of seriousness and it can be deeply earnest in its pursuit of novel soundscapes. And then postmodernism reacts to that. It says, there is no one great truth, there are many, everything is relative. The idea of a self-enclosed, self-referencing entity is a lie. There's no one correct answer to anything. Multiple styles can exist together. A typical postmodern piece will contain a mixture of genres. There's a sense that nothing matters. And often as a result, it's quite sarcastic. It can be quite humorous, but it can be quite negative. If nothing really matters, it's hard to believe in anything. And there's a sense of futility. If you like modernism, says this is what matters, whereas postmodernism says nothing matters. These ideas of meaning, purpose and the sense of artistic progress have obviously been things I've thought about throughout my career and my life. A few years ago I wrote an opera called Nothing, which is about a bunch of kids trying to figure out the meaning of life. And by the way, there's a new production of that which comes to Norwegian National Opera in Oslo next month. I'll link the details below. And for myself, I came to realise after a while that whilst I dislike on the whole the modernist tendency to be overly serious and over proud of its own clear direction and isolated self-referentialness, I also dislike the negativity that you get with postmodernism. I think I'm just more optimistic than your average postmodernist. And I try to create my own sense of meaning, to believe in hope and optimism, even while I simultaneously still kind of accept that nothing really matters. And that, it turns out, is pretty much what metamodernism is. It's an attempt to reconcile modernism and postmodernism by taking some of the things that postmodernism uses, the multiplicity of viewpoints, the non-linear irony, and it tries to then, within that, find some sense of meaning. It oscillates between different positions, that's where the meta comes from. It's between modernism and postmodernism in its stance, so it flips between the ironic and the heartfelt, the absurd and the deadly serious. And the example that Thomas Flight gives is the film Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, which is very much in a fragmented world, a multiverse of possibilities where nothing really matters. And that phrase runs through the film like a theme. Nothing matters. But it does somehow wrestle it back to this relationship between the mother and the daughter, and that becomes a place of genuine emotion and sentiment at the end of the film, until the same phrase is used in a more liberated way to suggest now a sense of freedom. We can do whatever we want. Nothing matters. And there are a number of authors who do similar things. I'm very fond of the author George Saunders, and his book Lincoln in the Bardo has this veering between surreal comedy and genuine emotion. So again, it's sort of in this in-between place, and that could be seen as a metamodernist book. And whilst I didn't think about all of these things when I was writing Luli Loops, I did suddenly come to the realisation that that was exactly the kind of thing that my piece was doing. I was abandoning the sense of stylistic unity, using chunks of another composer's work, but I was then putting them back together in ways which had this mixture, this range of emotions, you know, sometimes humorous, sometimes jokey, sometimes uncanny and almost scary. But sometimes, and perhaps most importantly, it was genuinely expressive. And for similar reasons, maybe Vaporwave itself is a form of metamodernism. Now, these are just names, I know, I don't really need or want to give myself a pigeonhole. But I had the distinct sense that I was personally breaking some new ground in this piece. And these terms have given me a new way to conceptualise what I've been trying to do. And if I have to have a label, I currently feel pretty happy being called a metamodernist. And if I have to label the piece itself, I'd also feel pretty happy to call it classical vaporwave. Oh. <laughs>